Oh, Lord Judas. There was no other choice. I could have given you a list of names. Yours on top. As soon as he told me, Anna, I said, why can't you go? Her exact words were, why in hell can't you go? If you love listening to this show, please consider giving a rating and a review on Amazon Alexa or wherever you listen. We want to continue bringing you this amazing content, and part of our ability to do that means that we need a big audience. Now, it may not seem like much, but rating and reviewing the show will help more people find us, just like how you found this show. Simply on any podcast platform, search for a show, scroll down to the bottom, and push five stars. It's that easy. Thanks for supporting the show. Today, I've been joined by Aaron Burnett, who is the founder and CEO of Space Ventures, a crowdfunding platform for space startups. Welcome to today's show. Thanks, Scott. Thanks for having me. So, Aaron, uh, you spent some five years in South America teaching and working. Can you tell us a little bit about the experience? Which countries did you go to? And how's your your Spanish or (laughs) Portuguese? My uh, Spanish is más o menos, as I like to say, uh, you know, more, more or less good. Um, yeah, so uh, five years, I, I spent five years in South America. I, I kind of call it my quarter life crisis, so to speak. You know, I was doing some fun stuff, uh, you know, fairly successful in my marketing career. And I decided I want to do something a little bit more impactful. Um, and so part of that was, you know, heading down at some friends down there teaching in Paraguay, um, and Asuncion, Paraguay. I uh, went down there speaking, you know, about three words of Spanish, uh, hola, uh, you know, agua, and maybe, maybe a couple more, gracias, and things like that. Uh, and just, you know, had to immerse myself in the culture and figure it out and spent a year teaching and volunteering uh, the, the following year. Uh, and then, you know, just uh, traveling around a little bit down there, uh, got really in, into the culture. We went to uh, one of my favorite cities, Buenos Aires. It's kind of a bus ride away from Paraguay. Uh, so we went down there a lot. Um, eventually met my wife down there uh, and uh, we, we met, uh, she's in Ecuador and we met in Buenos Aires together and we ended up, um, you know, fall in love, getting married and we came back to, uh, uh, the U.S. in Florida because we want to be a part of uh, the space economy. So that's that's a, a little bit of my experience down there. Well, how wonderful. Usually when we go on vacation or uh, live abroad for a while, we bring back home a souvenir. In this case, it looks like you brought <laughs> home a wife. So that, that's great. Congratulations. Yeah. Um, so I know that uh, you have also a very interesting fun fact as well is that you have a Pinterest account uh, called yeah. Mars Walkers that gets some 4 million unique views uh, per month. Uh, How did you start that and how do you even source some of that? Yeah, so I mean, that's a, you know, for me, uh, you know, it it really came about as a result of wanting to be a little bit more involved with with, uh, space, having seen the Falcon Heavy boosters land side by side. It felt like science fiction was real, was no longer a fiction. It was something to be a part of. And that really started me on this consuming as much space content as I could. And eventually that translated to wanting to maybe kind of share some of that. Uh, and that translated into um, the, the Pinterest account. And that was something where um, when we started it a little bit more than a year ago now, it was really relatively new space in, in Pinterest. Um, and uh, Pinterest was growing in the male demographic, which tends to be interest, uh, a heavy uh, interest in space and, um, and videos as well. So we just started you know, curating some of that content, pulling it together. And within five months, you know, we were over 3 million uh, unique monthly viewers. And that really surprised me, right? Because it was just sharing and finding cool space related content, inspiring content, which is what Pinterest is kind of about inspiration and, you know, sharing that with folks um, and taking advantage of that medium. It was really cool to see just how many millions of others around the world were just incredibly inspired by space and needed more content just like I did. Well, that's fascinating. And I think that's going to uh, dovetail right into what you're doing today, which is uh, space venture. So what is it? What's the backstory and what are you guys looking to achieve through it? 
Yeah, so, you know, great, um, great segue. So, you know, after you know, Mars Walkers, I see that kind of success. What it really cemented in me was just how large the interest was um, out there. I wasn't one of, you know, a hundred or a few thousand people. It was one of millions that really wanted more access and more content and more it, it access, access to the space industry. And so, um, what that kind of started me down was this idea of how can we help space startups? And that's natural because most of my you know, work career was actually in the space or in the uh, you know, tech and SaaS startup world. So, you know, I, I did uh, and enjoyed working with startups and I also enjoyed working with space. It was kind of a natural fit to go talk to space startups and see how I could help um, with this Mars Walkers thing in the back of my mind. And the more I talked with space startups, the more it became quite obvious that there's a seed funding problem for space startups. It's very difficult for a space startup to raise. Um, and most of them are often needing to raise two to five million dollars, which is a lot more than most seeds, early stage companies. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it was they were running into this problem over and over and over again. And that's when kind of the light bulb you know, kind of clicked in my mind was, well, hey, there's all these people that want to be involved. Why can't we bring the public in uh, and utilize that? And so that's when we started really digging into the, the Reg CF exemption, um, which is, you know, part of the JOBS Act, uh, the regulation crowdfunding exemption. So very similar, any Kickstarter or what have you, but with equity involved. And we really started to dig into that. And that's what we're trying to unlock with Space Ventures is really – bring accessibility to these early stage investments to the public. So I wanted to uh, explore this a little bit more is that, you know, I think many startups require uh, capital and certainly when it comes to anything that has hardware uh, component, it it's, tends to be capital intensive. I, I know when Hex started years ago and had operation in Shenzhou in China and then eventually in Silicon Valley, you know, their philosophy was that they could bring down the cost of doing hardware plays. And it, it's been interesting because I think, you know, here it's not just hardware and software, it's more than that. And can you talk a little bit about the complexity of what that means? Yeah, you know, as a space startup, you you have very specialized hardware, you know, often, you know, it could be rad hardened computer chips or what have you, and that already creates, you know, some, some cost problems right from the get go. Uh, but more importantly than just the fact that it's expensive is that it's expensive right from the get go. I mean, you, you really can't do anything until you spent a lot of money. And there's other factors too, um, taking taking into consideration just you know, getting a vacuum chamber test, right? <laughs> if you're lucky enough to have a partnership with a university that has one or, you know, a company that's willing to let you do it pro bono, it, maybe you can get some testing and valuable information that way. But oftentimes you, you could be spending hundreds of thousands of dollars just on ground-based testing. And then you have this, you know, pesky little thing of we need to put it into space. We need to transport it to where we want to be eventually if it's a satellite and that kind of thing. And, you know, as we all know, that, that can that can be millions of dollars. It depends on, you know, the scale of what you're trying to share, if there's a ride share available. And if there is a ride share, you may have to wait for months. It, you know, it's just the complexities of, of, of all of this and the fact that you really need to spend a lot of it right from the get-go. Yeah, I think, uh, I think you're spot on is that, you know, the conditions in space is so vastly different. And to be able to simulate that properly uh, is very difficult. And, of course, one of the first uh, gating factors is this notion of space uh, flight and heritage, this, you know, the fact that you actually have your product out there in space and being able to do what it says it can do. And then when you're dealing with things like highly pressurized, uh, you know, gases and liquids and chemicals, um, and then, of course, uh, the, you know, thermodynamics aspects and all the various complexity that comes with it, it is very difficult. Um, so you talk about the fact that uh, getting funding for these space startups from traditional sources is difficult. Uh, why is that and why are some of the, let's say, the VCs shying away from that? Well, you know, it, it makes sense if you, uh, you know, everyone thinks, all right, VCs have millions of dollars. Let's just, well, why aren't they writing those checks, right? Uh, there are complexities when it comes to capital formation. You know, normally, you know, the folks that are willing to take the kind of risk that happen in an early stage company, and when I say risk, I mean business risk, uh, you know, generally speaking, you have a product and we've We've sold it to a few people. Hey, I just need money to kind of scale that up. That's what it should be. But in space, it's 
I have an idea for a product or a very, very, you know, minimal kind of prototype and I need a million, two, five, whatever, millions of dollars to then take that into a, you know, commercially viable product that has flight heritage like you were mentioning. Um, and so the folks that are normally willing to write those checks, you know, angels are, are not writing that size of check very often. They, you know, the normal angel check could be anywhere from 25000 to 150000 And when you start to do the math, you realize, well, I need a lot of angels to write, <laughs> to, to find a lot of them that are interested in this, and there's a certain amount of them that aren't interested. Uh, and what it ends up turning into is if you stick to it long enough, you will get the money because you probably have a good idea and a good team and that kind of thing. Um, it's just it, it could take a year and maybe more <laughs> if you're not lucky. And then the VCs that may be able to write those checks all day long, they're used to seeing a company with some kind of revenue. And as we alluded to, you know, getting to that stage of flight heritage and all that, uh, that bar is pretty high. It's higher than for most, you know, startups. And you can just maybe throw $50,000 together, an interesting product and throw it out on the internet and see what people like. <laughs> um, doing that is not the same in space. And so uh, when a VC comes to look at this, they're looking at it as, well, there's all this risk already with any business so this early stage is risky but then i also have to think about the technological risk associated with can they get it to space what happens if it blows up right you know all these little things that you know compound and make it a very risky uh proposition and then one person like one person one vc whatever is writing that check you know that's uh, incredibly risky and so most you know startups we talk to they hear the same thing over and over from vcs that are capable of writing those checks they say come back to us we're really interested come back to us when you have revenue come back to us when you have x y or z and that x y or z is almost always two to five million dollars <laughs> away from them at that point so they're stuck in this in between so let's talk a little bit about the profile of the kinds of investors that would come onto your platform um, how would you define who they are and the kinds of interests and also the risk reward characteristics? I mean, that, that's great. I mean, so, you know, I think what really makes us unique is, is we're very, you know, public investor driven um, and interest in getting accessibility to the public. And so that's, you know, comes from my passion of wanting to be wanting to have access and not being able to and trying to find content and all this stuff. How can I get the public involved? It's our way of democratizing space. So the, the, Literally, the investor that's come to our platform can be absolutely anyone. It can be someone who's accredited, you know, is accredited to the SEC to be able to invest, but it can also be, you know, someone like myself or anyone that wants to invest as little as $25 on the platform. So it's, it's really about someone that's interested in, in space and wants to invest in the future. Um, but the risk that you mentioned, the risk is incredibly high. You know, you, you, you have to come at any any time you're a seed an angel investor, you have to come at it with a very, <laughs> with a willingness to lose all your money, a very high tolerance for losing all your money, oftentimes more than 50%, more than 80% in some cases that you're just planning on losing that money. Um, but there's a reward that can, can come with it. You know, you may be get really lucky in that, you know, that investment, 90% uh, of your investments get lost, but that one investment gets a 10, 100, 1,000 X return. And that's kind of, the, the, it's, a, it's a bit like gambling in that way, if you think about it, maybe even the odds in Vegas can be better, <laughs> but the reward is really that, you know, that big sort of unicorn that you're looking for. So, um, you know, it's an incredibly risky thing. And that's one of the reasons why what we've brought onto our platform is an investment board filled with people, you know, ex-NASA folks, uh, Oxford physicists, people that are very good at understanding the technological risks so they can say, hey, you know, this, this, this passes a certain level of muster. Uh, and then also the, uh, the, the investment risk in general, the business risk. Uh, so these are folks that can kind of act as a little bit of gatekeepers for us so that we know that the, the opportunities on our platform aren't bad actors, aren't very immature technology. Yes, there's a good chance they'll fail, but they're the better uh, half of the, other, uh, of the availability uh, or the available options out there. Well, I, I think uh, it's just certainly I, I appreciate you setting the right expectation in terms of the high risk nature uh, on the speculation side. I'm sure Finra has some uh, comments around, you know, the potential multiples. But um, you're right. And just to reiterate that you know, it's risky for VC. So for un, uh, not accredited in individual or retail investors, even it's even riskier because as a percentage of their overall relative net worth. But again, we're talking about very small amounts. So I think one of the ways I think you're trying to frame it is that 
it's more about interest and passion. So if you can spend $20 on, let's say, a passion toy or passion drink, why could you, why could you not spend $20 on a passion uh, that you have towards space? Uh, which brings to a, a kind of a bigger theme, which is this, you know, what's happening in a broader scale with NASA and the Launch America mission. It's, it's kind of, you know, reminiscent, nostalgic of the Kennedy days and uh, our route to, uh, you know, the moon the first time. And it really has brought kind of a new resurgence around our imagination and aspiration towards space exploration. Yeah, it, and um, it, it's it's important too because it's one of the anecdotes I like to think about is you know Launch America mission happens and you know people respond to that in a variety of ways. They watch the live stream, they go watch other YouTubers or things like that that are doing space related content. They go maybe buy a space T shirt or a Launch America mission T shirt or something right to really you know show their support and and, and be able to engage in a, some way. Uh, and then the there's others that go and they go on their Robinhood app and they invest in uh, Virgin Galactic, totally unrelated to SpaceX, uh, other than the whole, in, you know, it's related to the space industry. Um, but, you know, that, there was 20,000 new investors just on Robinhood app right after uh, the Launch America mission. It's a, it, and that's, how, that's the type of person I would be, right? I, oh, well, this is cool. How can I invest in space or how can I be a part of that in a meaningful way? And I think that's that's the way of thinking about it. If you can be a part of this company, help them to be a little bit successful, that'd be awesome. And then, you know, if there is that reward, then we do get a little bit uh, of the kickback on that, the return on that. So that's, you know, I, th I think that's the right way of approaching this, uh, is thinking of it as more of a passion and a way to involve yourself in the industry and be meaningfully involved in the industry rather than just kind of watching a TV or, or buying t-shirts or whatever. Um, if you want that little bit more meaningfulness, you know, that would be a, one way of doing it. Yeah, I, I, I do agree with you that that's probably the right way to fra phrase it. Um, I'm just kind of smiling because of the Robin Hood reference uh, and the institutional feeling that the, the retail investors have kind of turned things upside down uh, mm -hmm. from the fundamentals. But uh, that's besides the point for, for this episode. But there's another uh, mega theme that's happening as well that's pushing the envelope in terms of space, and that is the creation of the Space Force. And at the time of this recording, we've heard that uh, some of the other military branches have started to carve out portions of their units that's going to go get or gets you know absorbed into the Space Force. So how is the Space Force going to push uh, this frontier even further and faster? Well, I mean, a lot of uh, a defense investment ends up somehow benefiting the industry. I mean, the classic one is the DARPA net, right? I mean, you know, that's kind of the birthplace of the internet. There's some argument around that, but still, like that, when it, we probably wouldn't be the same uh, where we are today with the internet if we didn't have something like that. And those sorts of things are very. You know, uh, it's it's very good for the industry to see that kind of stuff. Not to mention, there's kind of local interest in things like that as well. I mean, if you have a whole branch of the military that's worried about solving problems like how do we get people in space, uh, they have budgets. And I think this is something that I, I was just talking about this today with someone. Uh, you know, the NASA budget feels big when you look at one big number. <laughs> and that's it. Uh, but when you compare it to, let's say, any of the other, you know, defense uh, budgets that are out there, it's, it's minuscule. So when you can start to add more opportunities to, for research and development in space, uh, the smartest minds in the world and the planet or, you know, even in our nation focused on those problems, we're going to see, you know, the big hard nuts to crack. They're going to start to crack. And, and then the commercial industry can come along and pick up some of those, uh, you know, some of the remnants and pick up some of the, the commercial opportunities that come out as a result, because there's always going to be a need for government um, sort of investment, because there's no real, uh, let's say this, there's probably no real commercial, immediate commercial viability for someone to go straight to, you know, explore Mars right now. You know, uh, the, the, there may be some opportunity, but the exploration and that side of things, that's a government driven sort of market and a lot of interesting technology comes out of that. So I think there's a lot of a lot of cool R&D that will come out of it. And it will be good to see the attention given to space that I, that I think it deserves. All right. So for listeners who are excited about where things are going with uh, the space as a sector, how can people learn more about what you're doing? 
Yeah, so, you know, you can go to our website. It's spacedventures.com. It's space with a D, uh, ventures.com. And, um, yeah, we, we try and get everyone involved as much as we can. Uh, you can sign up for, at the time of this recording, uh, it's early access. We'll be launching here soon. So hopefully by, you know, the time you're listening to this, we'll be able live and you'll be able to go in and invest or at least play around with the data sets that we're uh, putting live to people. Super. So with that, I've been joined by Aaron Burnett, who is the CEO of Spaced Ventures. Thanks for joining today. Thanks, Scott. I appreciate it. If you've enjoyed this episode, take a moment to rate our show on any podcast platform that you listen to. Scroll down to the bottom and push five stars. It's that easy. And as always, thanks for listening.